Well, I guess I'm welcoming everyone. Uh, we've had some technical snafus here and there through the conference, and uh, Steve's computer has not wanted to cooperate, but he just rejoined, so maybe he, he'll want to take over. Uh, I'll start us off, and then he can let us know if he's ready. Um, my name is Lucy. Gray, and this is the final keynote of the 7th Annual Global Education Conference. And I'm here with my co-founder, Steve Hargadon, and a longtime friend of the conference, Gavin Dykes, who runs the Education World Forum and does all sorts of neat things with uh, education leaders all over the world. So we're thrilled to have you, Gavin, and um, I think you're going to give us the right words of wisdom to close this conference. You're always a comforting presence. Um, when we're talking shop about education, and especially uh, given all the changes in the world that are going on now. So thank you and welcome, Gavin. Thank you. Uh, now, are you going to go through the first few slides? Yeah, I'll go through the first few slides, and then um, I'll, I'll say over to you. How about that? Um, that would so, be good. OK. So I just want to say a little bit about our sponsors. Uh, without the help of these companies, we would not be able to bring you this event for free. And we really appreciate um, these innovative and forward thinking and, and globally oriented companies who believe in what we do. VIF International Education, Google for Education, TEZ, Iron USA, and a host of others who have supported us along the way. I also want to make sure that everyone knows that Chrome Warrior has been a really close partner with us during this event. And they helped me to develop a gamification uh, game uh, to, for, for this conference. So you can go to our front web page, our, our web page, globaleducationconference.com, and there is a link there to an online game that we have developed in order for you to make the most of your conference experience. If you submit evidence and get 300 points, we will send you a participant certificate and badge by December 31st. Um, and we want to make sure everybody has the opportunity to do that. We will not be sending any other certificates other than uh, general ones to the presenters. So if you want a certificate of participation, you need to play the game. So thank you to Chrome Warrior. Uh, and if you have any questions about it, um, please let me know. Again, that will be open to um, December 31st. So this is our favorite part of the introduction process. We enable the, um, the whiteboard privileges, and we let everyone um, take the tool that looks like a star to the left of the whiteboard and indicate where they are in the world. And I am in Northbrook, Illinois, which is just outside Chicago. And, um, in the middle of the United States. And uh, I see that we have a lot of people in the US. If you also want to tell us where you are exactly in the chat, your exact location, and give us a fun fact, or tell us what time or the weather is like, and, and so that we can kind of compare notes. So we've got Miami. We've got Israel. How global can we go? Probably pretty late in some places here. Garland, Texas, all right. New York City, London, Romania, uh, Radford University, Virginia, Portland. Anyone else from, uh, who's, who's, there's Romania, there's the UK. Anyone else? Dallas. OK, hopefully we've got Canada. Thank you, Canada is represented. OK, if there's anybody else there, quickly put where you are and introduce yourself in the chat. You are amongst friends. And hopefully during this event, you've had the opportunity to make some new connections that you'll uh, keep beyond the scope of this conference. Um, Steve is, is around, and he'll be here, but he's having technical difficulties. And I'm sure he'll have a few closing words for us after uh, Gavin tells us about his work. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to turn this over to Gavin. Thank you so much for coming and honoring us with your presence once again. Thank you, Lucy. Uh, and thank you for everybody for being online. I, uh, 
I want to talk about the Maverick Teachers Global Summit, which was something uh, that we did earlier on this year, in July, in fact. Um, but just starting off and reflecting on um, how the last few months have gone, I don't want to reflect on them too far. However, I, it sort of put, me, put a certain context to things. If the last few months tell me anything, it's that I don't really know or necessarily understand how everyone else is feeling or whether they're happy or whether they're hurting and what worries them. So to work well in this world, I suspect I need to spend more time listening and, and listening to other people, not just the ones that I happen to get on particularly well with, but a wide range of other people. And global competency seems to me to be something a bit like that. Lots to do with listening often being challenged. And I wonder if if we develop global competency in that competency in that way, that it might do something greater for my domestic competency. Because my domestic competency is primarily gauged around the people that I really know and who are part of, in a sense, my group of people. Uh, but actually by going going into global competency we think more broadly. So that's one little thought about it. I think also we, we often hear about international challenges on television, radio or websites. If we get it right with international challenges, it should help open up our minds and with more open minds we might better recognize some of the challenges we face closer to home. And I think of that, uh, you know, here in the UK there are plenty of children who are hungry when they come to school. There are plenty of children who are uh, have really challenging circumstances at home, just as there are in every country. But sometimes, uh, sometimes we need something else to open that up to us or to make us aware of it. And perhaps, in a strange sort of way, the, the global and the local come together and each can help the other. So I think. Then I, I was thinking a little bit about real world problems, and this is when I get on to the, the real story. And, and uh, if I can go back a little while, inspiring action towards solving real world problems was something that came to mind over lunch I had with some friends in London a couple of years ago. At the table were two good friends, Ramji Raghavan and Jim Wynn. Jim is the CEO of Imagine Education, and one or two people on this call will know him. And Ranji is the founder of the Agastya International Foundation, which is based in rural India on a campus about two and a half hours outside Bangalore. As we were talking, we talked about how can we support greater courage and innovation amongst teachers and encourage us all to open our eyes to different challenges across the world. That's how we started. We talked, wouldn't, wouldn't it help to be focusing on some of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. But, we thought, not Goal 4, because that's the one on education. And education should apply to every single one of the goals. Our conversation continued. Let's, let's not talk about innovation too much. We hear that too often. It's kind of a bit of an overused term. And we don't want a conference overloaded with present presentations. If we're traveling a long way across the world, the last thing we should be doing is listen to presentations. We should learn from each other. And I think often the best way of learning from each other is to work together to build something. Frankly, that's true whether we're traveling a fairly short distance to go to college in the evening or a shorter still distance to go to school. But what we should be trying to do with this event that we were thinking of building up was we should seek to build understanding between the participants and explore ideas that we might act upon. And indeed that anybody could act upon if we could share those ideas in a particular way. By the time we got to coffee at that lunch, things were beginning to come together. We should invite innovative and creative people. Yeah, yeah, maverick teachers was what we thought to give it a new name. Uh, not that new a name, but just a slightly different name. Uh, clearly, children should play an equal role in developing the ideas and guiding the work. 
and we thought it should take place at Agastya's campus, and we could call it the Maverick Teachers Global Summit. And so the idea was born. As a result, about two years later, in July this year, there was heading for Bangalore. Of course, in the interim, we'd done a lot of preparatory work. We prepared a program, the ideas, and recruited participants from across the world and chosen the particular goals the, from the sustainable goal, development goals on which we might work. At this stage, I, I, I think I should say something about the Agastya International Foundation. Agastya was started by Ranji in the picture there, uh, who established the foundation about 16 years ago. I first met Ranji and Ajit, his uh, director of programs, around seven years ago when we all worked uh, together on HB's Catalyst Initiative. Some of you may know it. Ramji, after a successful career in the US and the UK, had returned to India and set up Agastya. And Agastya's intention was to develop a nation of curious children. That is, to develop their curiosity in a country where, at that time, there was little practical hands-on work at school. No experiments in science, no painting, no making clay models in art. Those kinds of things were absent as I understand. And if we take a little look at the, the nature of the campus, uh, I think just when you drive into the campus at Agasta, you would begin to see that there might be something going on. Uh, there in the background, and you might see a, a plane with ladders so the kids can climb up into the plane and play with it. And in the foreground, you've got a an elephant made from pieces of scrap. Uh, and the Agastya just has this um, way of being playful, uh, providing opportunities to build things and make things together. And that's really, I think, a big part of what Agastya has been about. The Charitable Trust first thought of building and running schools. And here's a real point of innovation, I think. Had they taken that route of building and running schools, let's say they had a couple of schools, how many, how many children would that mean? How many new children would they have coming to them each year? I reckon maybe 200, maybe 400, some, somewhere in that region. And in a country of over a billion people, that seems just like a small, very small drop in the ocean. In fact, a million still seems like quite a small drop in the ocean. But 200 to 400 children is not going to change the education system or actually move to innovate things more broadly. But instead, Agastya developed a strategy to work with India's existing schools to enhance children's education through that existing system. And the first steps they took along that route were to identify simple and replicable simulations and science experiments. And those simple simulations included things like the thing you can see there, which are um, examples of the rotation of the Earth and the Sun and the Moon and how they play off against each other. What you also see there is one of the Indian students explaining that to a visitor from the United States. Um, because a big part of what happened with this was not that the children were simply being taught and they were quietly, they, they become involved with the models and if they are, show capability in presenting things to others, then that is encouraged too. And one of the great programs at Agastya is their Young Instructor Leaders program, which is just developing, uh, uh, developing that group and encouraging the development of their skills so that they can magnify the learning that Agastya undertakes. So how did they get these experiments out as the rural schools of India? Well, they did it by vans or trucks, I guess many of us would call them. So they loaded these experiments into the back of these trucks and took them out uh, often beyond the ends of the metal roads to 
into the villages of India. Where, and that's where the children would come across them. They might take them into the village centres or into the village schools and then work with the children so that they could understand more about science, particularly at that stage, uh, and yet engage with learning in a hands-on way. Now, taking science experiments out into the rural India doesn't seem like a way to reach many people when you first hear it. But when I first came across Agastya, um, they were reaching around um, a million children a year. So compare that, compared to that two to 400 children that you might have if you developed a couple of schools, I think something quite extraordinary was happening. I first visited Agastya's campus. Uh, it's about three or four years ago. It feels feels longer. Uh, and by by that time, the Agastya's work was reaching actually about a million and a half. Now, in addition to the trucks taking practical learning experiments into the villages, boxes of science uh, equipment, and they have some specific kinds of boxes for different subjects. Uh, those science experiments were being carried by motorcycles, so the motorcycles can get get yet deeper into the countryside and get to the schools located there. And Agastya's campus was bringing into it, well, it's now bringing into it between 400 and 800 children a day. So that uh, we're reaching, instead of that two to 400 a year, about 800 a day on a good day uh, as you go through the year. And on the campus, they've developed a, a whole series of, I think, wonderful resources. It must be like, um, I don't know, the educational equivalent of traveling to Disneyland to go to Agastya. The, the fun that can be had from learning uh, is just, with the equipment that they had, is extraordinary. The campus facilities include lots of facilities for hands-on learning and hands-on learning in science in math and technology, in ecology, in media and art. It includes a discovery centre where localised versions of the types of interactive exhibit, exhibits that you, some of you will have seen in San Francisco's Exploratorium uh, are held. Those exhibits are not exactly as they are in the Exploratorium, but more built for the localised, uh, or, or localised in their nature and for the culture of students. The, the, the Guru Gruha Astronomy Centre is a fully fledged planetarium, which allows discovery of the stars and study of astronomy. They have things like butterfly gardens. Now, if you're studying ecology, this is just an example of the butterflies that come through the Agastya campus, and they put in the, the, the plants that particularly attract those butterflies. Uh, there are now more than 100 species of butterfly that have been recorded on the campus. And I think when we were there in July, uh, the number just increased, I think it was to 102. So that uh, a fantastic diversity, uh, but that diversity hasn't been, uh, hasn't come about by accident. Uh, over the period that Agastya has been there, they have planted, I think it is 48,000 indigenous trees the site was a brownfield site when they got to it, and they replanted it to bring it back to the ecology that was there in the past. And those of us who went there in July each planted another tree to continue that work. Alongside the trees that have been planted on the campus, they planted 18,000 trees in the schools and villages around Angastia's location so that not only are they improving the campus, they're developing the knowledge of the local indigenous plants in the schools and going around and looking after those trees and helping the children and the schools look after those trees and develop them in their own locations. But perhaps my favorite of all the uh, learning objects, if that's what it could be called, is on the slope of the hill in Agastya. This is difficult to see in this photograph, and I apologize for that, but if you, in the foreground you see the auditorium and their theater, if you like, and in the background 
just just above the auditorium, slightly in front of a temple that is sitting on a hill. It is marked out on that hill um, a man, a woman, and a child. And if you walk up that hill, what you will see is plants growing in the outlines of the man, the woman, and the child. And the plants that grow there are the plants that are used in traditional Indian medicine. So if you walk to where the stomach of the child is, then what you will see is the plants that might be used to treat sickness or stomach pains. If you walk to the head, the plants that are used to treat migraine and headaches. So that uh, it's a wonderful way to learn those traditions in Indian medicine of uh, how to use the plant life in order to, uh, to help illnesses of different kinds. Uh, and I must say I've been glad of it. That I once have, or twice have had cause to have something for my stomach while I've been there <laughs> and uh, to have a tea made of the appropriate herbs, which happens to include ginger, of course, uh, is a very good way of recovering and getting back to full health. Back to the Maverick Teachers Global Summit. So that's where I was. I, I beg your pardon. That's just a, a picture of uh, teachers being taken round the um, round the uh, plants and learning about the medic medicinal plants that there are. Sorry. Back to the man. Uh, the the Maverick Teachers Global Summit. So what we thought we should do is work with the a number of the UN development sustainable development goals. There's no there was no point in us looking at all 17 of them. Uh, I think that would have been too broad. Uh, we depended on of course on the number of people we had there, but our plans were to have something around 50 teachers that, uh, join in with this. So we picked out seven, which were food and water, consumption, gender equality, energy, infrastructure, climate, and habitat. One of the nice ways in which the people at Agastya encapsulated that was in the logo that you see there in the background. You can see clearly some water. You can see on the trees some birds uh, representing different parts of this. You can see the bits of climate represented in there and the infrastructure, the cog. Uh, so that uh, that logo, that big painted logo, was a, a form of a logo that also appeared in all the paperwork. Uh, the other thing about that painted logo, it was painted uh, using uh, cattle manure so that it was a very sustainable form of paint and actually a very beautiful picture uh, coming from those simple materials. And also on the ground there, you may notice that uh, some of the link to the artistic work done on the campus, the deer there in the foreground, uh, seemingly swimming across the stage uh, were changed each day so it wasn't always deer and sometimes it was hippos. Uh, those animals were just part of the artwork which brought cheer I think and good things and, and encouraged I think the creativity of all who study there in one way or another and indeed all the teachers who came to Maverick Teacher Global Summit. Overall, in the Maverick Teacher Global Summit, we had uh, teachers from countries that included Belgium, Canada, Chile, Finland, Malaysia, people from the Netherlands, the UK, the United States. We had around, I think it was 70 people coming in altogether. Uh, and our intention was to put people in groups of at least five, with facilitators in each group, and then to work on each group to work on a single uh, one of the millennia sustainable development goals. What we did as we were working on that was to go through a design process and I think this design process is a really important part of the whole thing that the Maverick Teachers Global Summit encapsulated. The design process was to take for each group to take the sustainable development goal that they were assigned to and to unpick how they might develop learning around it. 
And here we were focusing on pedagogies, ways in which that could be developed and developed well. The, the design process uh, also necessitated the groups, these international groups, so people from many different countries, and of course uh, a great number of, of people from India, uh, would have discussions around how they would approach this. And through that, they would learn the different, uh, in a sense, the different prejudices of different people within the group, or, or the different things that really exercise their minds because of where they were from. So there was learning done right at that first stage. Having come up with some of the challenges associated with teaching and learning uh, at, of a particular goal, they then took those ideas of the challenges to children, children from the local schools, and presented those to the children. This wasn't teaching the children. This was saying these were our ideas and having the children critique them. And in doing so, they got feedback on where the children were coming from and what they thought. And so the children began a process of co-designing along with the teachers. And that as we step through for, from those challenges to potential solutions and then to prototypes, they, the children were consulted at each step. The teachers did the work in between and the groups did the work in between. And so ultimately, we got to solutions, which was a co-design from the students. A great example of one of these co-designs, and Tony, who I think is on this call, was one of the architects of this in a big way, um, was um, to, to look at climate change. And in the climate change discussions, and I hope I have the story right as Tony is listening, uh, is that uh, it, it, within those discussions, they, they talked about the, the challenges. And one of the children talked about a conversation that he had had with his grandfather. And they had talked about how sparrows used to be common, little birds, common little birds, but now there are very few sparrows, and so things had changed. And to what extent was that to do with climate? And to what extent were the things we could do about that and change it, and in a sense, and give sparrows opportunity to come back? So those sorts of ideas raising the, uh, putting it into a context that children would happily understand and happily work with. Well, that idea came from a child first. And what Tony and his group did was to work on that in a, a, a wonderful way, in a creative way. And uh, I saw just today how that has continued to be worked on. And I think will soon be launched into a website as a website to uh, take that learning forward, to share it more widely, and to enable that prototype to be used by many others. I think it's, it, and this is exactly what the intention of the Maverick Teachers Global Summit was, to look at new pedagogies to come up the way with new ways of looking at things, and then to share those so that others might benefit from them. And maybe we'll get some movement towards resolving those goals or reaching those goals rather than simply uh, being troubled by uh, or, or rather than learning about them in some academic way. The people that were in the Maverick Teachers Global Summit had all kinds of expertise and this led to all kinds of learning for all of us. So for example, there was one of the Indian teachers who had used origami and kirigami to help some children learn math. So by using the folding of paper and kirigami is the cutting, well, uh, a mixture of cutting and folding. Uh, and the, with those simple tools had, was helping slum children with their math. There was another who had specialized in toy making and learning. There were people who were specialists in ecology and the natural world. One person from the north of India working in the Himalaya. Uh, who was his, his, all his teaching was about the natural world. There were people who were focused on visual design thinking. Uh, sorry, I've got a little behind there. Visual design thinking, 
and for, there was uh, others who were specialists in photography and filmmaking, and others who looked at language. Of course, there was technology, math, performing arts, science, music, and poetry. Now, all of those different mixes were um, great contributors, and I think that looking beyond, again, looking beyond our, in many senses, our comfort zones, the things that we were always looking at, the, you know, if we're always working with scientists and we do science, that's fine, but by looking over those borders to people who talked about language, the kinds of challenges that came through that, for example, were uh, there were those um, who were looking at language, they were very concerned about teaching using Western languages. Because of the things in Western language, and this I think was the central theme of their concern, was that the, the, the construct of Western languages with subject, verb, and object very much puts somebody in control of everything. So I did this was, you know, I'm in charge, I'm doing this. Whereas actually some of the more, uh, some of the Eastern languages are more likely to talk about the community and the impact of the community. So I think those kinds of challenges to our thinking and, and to seeking to run this uh, event were great opportunities to learn and look beyond our normal bounds. Of course, our days were uh, filled with work, but then in the evenings, uh, I don't, wouldn't say we danced like this, but we had the opportunity to um, to see in the auditorium again uh, some uh, uh, sometimes children dancing and music played by children, sometimes singing, local singing, and there was a great series of events in the evening to enjoy and make for indeed a very full day. It all added that art alongside the work and the art alongside the science, I think, to make a great experience for all who went there. Another contribution to the experience came from a couple of young Dutch people from Jungens van der Tekeningen. Um, I feel as though I should say that again because I probably got the pronunciation wrong, but it's Jungens van der Tekeningen which is a company which is, um, uses visual design to help thinking through problems uh, to aid, uh, often to aid in conferences, not just to produce a record of the conference, but actually to aid the thinking that people are undertaking and intending to do as they work their way through. They produced, they helped us with that thinking, and they also produced a record of the event as a whole. And if you look very closely at the picture up on the screen now, um, right in the, uh, just to the left of the centre, you can see the little picture of a bird and a tree. And there, that's the climate group, and that's one of the sparrows that is, um, was hard to find. And uh, But each of the groups appears in that picture. You can see to the left there the logo, uh, and all of that is in effect a record of our experiences at the Agastya um, campus and with the Maverick Teachers Global Summit. We spent most of our time working in the auditorium uh, and that was, uh, that was great and uh, uh, frequently in that auditorium it was filled with children. And I think what the, I think one of the things that was fantastic about this whole event, uh, Ramji, back to him, who started the Gastia, um, Ramji often talks about learning and the ah uh, aha ha ha route to learning. So the ah bit is when you first start explaining an idea. The aha uh, when you begin to understand, and then there's a kind of almost a release of joy and a ha-ha moment when you, you've got it and you really know what has been talked about. And I think of that event in a way that the ah-ha, ha-ha moment came for many of us on the Thursday evening of the week that we worked together in, in back near Bangalore was when we went out uh, and thanks to Agastya's organisation we went out into the villages 
from which the children we had been working with came. And we saw the villages, we saw something of their homes, and we saw the schools that they attended. It's nothing quite like that to see that on the ground. Agastya is a, the campus is a marvel and they've done fantastic work to build that up. But actually going out into these farming villages to see something of what life is really like on a day-to-day -day basis there and to learn more about it, I think was a, a brilliant moment in what was a fantastic week. I think uh, just, just one of the examples that comes from that, um, thinking about that, is one of the pieces of work and the projects that Agastya undertakes was they recognised that children often would attend school and be very keen and their parents would be keen that they attend school. However, if the parents were illiterate, when it comes to the point that children are being given homework, then real difficulties come because there is nobody to help those children with their homework. And uh, they will struggle and fall further behind. And in the end, if you're not careful, they will follow their parents into the fields and actually um, be, uh, there will be a real challenge in them achieving anything different from that which their parents achieved. I'm not diminishing anything that their parents achieved, but just saying that the progress is difficult to make. So the, what they introduced was a volunteer system where volunteers would go and work in the schools um, often six days a week, six evenings a week. So after the school day, what they run is effectively um, support groups for people doing their homework. And the whole idea of those volunteer groups, Nagastia pays for the volunteers, supports volunteers and makes sure that they are trained effectively. Those volunteers, of course, learn something about what it is to be a teacher and may go on to take that route as they develop themselves. Often they're young people, uh, but they, we went to classes, I've been to classes in those evenings where there are 60 or 70 children being supported. And I, I remember asking the first time I saw one of those classes supporting the children doing their homework. I asked about how many of class, those classes were going on. And on that evening, there were more than 80 classes going on to support children doing their homework. So if you look in the local area, 80 times 70, and you can work out roughly how many children are being supported. So the, the, really what comes of that, we, we came to an end, we presented to uh, the results of the, uh, the work of the teachers in each of the groups, and then we all might have gone home. But um, we did, all did go home, I think. But what happened as a result? Well, I think a number of things. One, we have the memory of going to those schools and shared memories. So those are the children in the school, in their own schools, in the local schools, and pointing out where in the world on a globe quickly found uh, to find to find where we were all from. Uh, but what happened as we thought about heading homewards was just reflecting what came from it was the lasting friendships and re relationships that have come. And there are loads of things that have come as a result of that, of course. Uh, friendships, I'm glad to say, happen frequently. Films, photos, blogs and materials are coming and are being produced by Agastya and being brought together. And they've been working on a lot of that ever since we had the event in Ju July, but there's an awful lot of material put together. There have been things like uh, Ajay, who I mentioned earlier, uh, ran a class for Tommy. And Tommy is in Vermont, Ajay is in the Himalaya, and uh, he ran a class on yoga using video conference. Just those interchanges would be exciting and we would learn things from. A little different from our normal video conference in class, I guess, but something that's exciting and just puts different parts of the world in contact with each other. There's a, a water pro project which is being internationally shared, in fact, led by um, one of the teachers from Belgium who took place, uh, who, who has worked to develop a website, and that has actually expanded beyond the countries of 
um, beyond the countries that took part in the global summit and gone, it spread on outwards from there. Of course, there was the, uh, the, the that project with the sparrows, which is um, beautifully titled, Where Have All the Sparrows Gone? And that is just about to be launched, if I understand Tony's emails correctly. And that uh, is another development, and just sharing what might be done and the action children could take to help address the reduction on, in the number of those birds. Part of it, of course, is actually that action, but part of it is uh, applying scientific method, measuring these things, working out how many birds there are, finding out from parents what things used to be like. So there's all kinds of activities around this which help it to be a wider investigation and actually something you can really uh, assess where you are and do something about. There's all there's new support for Agassi's work and approach, which has come through, and I'm delighted to see a variety of people, a variety of the teachers who took part, have been working on developing their support in different ways and contributing to the movement that Agastya, in a sense, has un undertaken. Uh, and I think their links with Agastya will always um, will always continue. So. There is all kinds of things that, are, that have come from that, and there's, so we've been connecting teachers, students, teacher leaders, building new working relationships, developing learning and new uh, learning about new cultural conditions and locations, learning from local children, which I think was one of the great things that came from this, and I think other people have picked up on addressing the sustainable development goals and actually what we've done by this is also not kind of shouting about remember these 17 goals, but actually taking actions uh, and developing work towards achieving those goals. And working in real conditions uh, and with real world solutions. So working collaboratively through a design process is part of that and building prototype learning with practical outcomes. Uh, I've done the well, what happened as a result. And if in conclusion, the things I think uh, I would like to bring out, there's lots of different conclusions. Each person will have their own. But Mavericks, by definition, don't follow rules. That makes it a challenge. But that's a pretty good challenge, because that links back to the uh, learning from other people that I mentioned right at the beginning. Language influences and can influence the way we behave and work, that piece of learning that came from those who had studied language. The value of following a design process is, is, is fantastic. The criticality of learners' voices and including them in the whole process of learning and directing it, and of course, teacher voices. The empathy with culture and background that comes from working in these international groups and just thinking beyond our own boundaries and freeing up thinking through working in other countries and cultures can be a spur to innovation and improving our work domestically. And I think just to round this up, uh, it, it was a fantastic experience. That's the, the group of us who were, if you like, central to that. I have to say that uh, all the people who worked in Agastya to make this happen uh, give them extraordinary credit. There were those who led them through to the people who, who made us our food and served us our food uh, in the canteen, uh, to the people who cleaned the rooms and prepared for us coming, uh, to the people who looked after the plants and who look after the plants, but who deal with the ecology and take us around that. So there were all kinds of people who actually contributed to the complete success of the event. They, uh, and really thank them all. There were also uh, people like the sponsor synopsis mentioned there. So this couldn't happen without some support and some financing. Some came from there, some came from the NEA Foundation, some from the British Airways, some from Jungels van der Tekeningen, who I've mentioned already, some from Straw Hat Visuals, uh, uh, who produced some uh, a, a wonderful blog and beautiful photographs of it all, but um, particularly from all the teachers, children, facilitators who made such a great event. 
and I think it was um, one of the most joyful examples I've had of learning learning in an international situation. And would I do it again? Well, just try to stop me. And that's it. Well, I'll just try to stop you. You stopped. Uh, Steve, do you want to you want to <laughs> take a come? Steve, are you here, Steve? I thought Steve was here. I thought he overcame Sorry, the difficulty. I'm struggling bandwidth. Uh, I I just have one question before you guys wrap up. Um, Gavin, what do you what can we do to support? Um, this organization and and maybe I missed this. Uh, I know you and I have talked about it. What about future plans? Are there going to be more of these, or is the idea going to be around other people replicating this model? What can, yeah. So basically, what's the future plans, and how can we help support as a as a as a GEC community? Right. I the 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 first thing I. You know, just in terms of support or, or learning about what Agastia does, um, the the website is there, and there's a, a range. And well done, Peggy. That uh, donating is one of the ways in which it can be done. For example, one of the, the schools in England has is pulling together books uh, because there is a new library going in on, on the uh, on the campus. And uh, they have produced, I was going to say books to order. They've obviously been in touch with the Gastia to discuss what kinds of books and what age group of books they, uh, they want those books for. And they have worked with the Gastia to get them, uh, or they are working to get them across there. So that's, you know, money is one thing, um, books is another. Um, I think. Uh, you know, just being in touch with them uh, where we can to to work out what it is they need for their their next steps and contributing in whatever way is possible. The, the, I think the the other thing is that this is um, I, I have had people ask me about whether the uh, this is different countries talking about almost franchising the idea, and um, I think we're very happy that it happens in other countries. It's a they're, they're, I think the model is there's a lot that's good in it, and there's a lot to develop from it. So it's not necessarily just doing the same thing. But if you find the right organizations uh, with which to collaborate, then this kind of thing, I think, uh, can be done elsewhere. And fo following that design process, you know, there are key elements in this. Key elements, I would say, are getting the right kinds of participants, the kinds of participants who uh, have at their core the same sense of values, the same sense of values about the contribution that children can make and that can teachers can make, and uh, you, you can bring that stuff together in that way. And it's uh, so that then the design process through which everybody works, and that relationship between teachers and students, so that the students are not simply. Um, taking on board what they are given but are contributing to the value of the final final uh, final work together. I, so just there's probably a set of principles that should be written down or, or agreed beforehand. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily say it's it's even for us to say these are the principles. It's for people to work it out. And if that is something that they can collaborate around, then to take it forward in in some sort of Global summit. I think that some of these principles, though, serve as kind of guideposts for people, and and how you interpret it and apply it is it should be unique to every local situation. So I think you know Absolutely. some of the things I've heard. You know, there's some common themes. Thinking back at the sessions I've been to, which have been mostly the keynotes at this year's GEC, and design thinking has been one. The SDGs are driving a lot more than I expected. Um, in terms of, of this kind of work. Um, the personal relationships and, and, and starting local and, and grassroots, that's also been a big part of this. Um, it, you know, we're kind of, it's, it's really interesting. I mean, I think there are a lot of policy groups out there 
and you have a lot of experience working with policymakers, of, of yeah, I think the real action is happening at the local personalized level. And, Absolutely. And, and so, like, how do we, you know, especially here in the U.S., I, I think, regardless of your politics, I still, you know, how do we get the policymakers to become more flexible thinkers and be more risk takers? That seems to me to be the crux of the issue. It's so formalized. You know, you and I know we're in meetings all the time with people who are so formal about everything instead of, like, thinking about what's yeah. best for the community. So any feedback on that? I think the... Um, uh, if anything should tell us something about the last period is actually the risk is not to listen to the local community um, and not to take you know, the risks are actually on the opposite sides from those that we think they are and um, you know following the following the rules um, and just doing the standard stuff I think it's a severe risk it's uh, you know we get people jumping through hoops which kind of give us a very standard kind of education and that's sort of lauded as being grand uh, but I think actually the world is a somewhat different place and it's interesting society is a different place um, so with the changes that we've seen in society over the previous years and the changing economics and circumstances of different places uh, means that uh, if you just set up these rigid models of learning then I think we have uh, we're, we're taking a particular kind of risk. Things that are more about that listening I was talking about, and listening beyond the groups, beyond the standard groups that we work in, uh, is something that blinds us. Uh, or that is absolutely vital for us. And if we're blind to that, I think it's, uh, it's it, that's where the the dangers and the risks lie. So, you know, this gives me hope. I, I don't feel like the world is falling apart. Uh, I think a lot of us have felt that way in the U.S. within the last week or so. I, I'm sure you've felt it in the U.K. to a certain extent. And um, in other parts of the world, obviously, are not immune to strife. Uh, but this gives me hope because, you know what, I think, I think we ha for once we have some clear indicators of, of how, where we need to go and what we haven't paid attention to. And this week in general, and we'll get into this in our closing session next, has made me feel a lot better, a lot more hopeful, and I know that they're like-minded people who are interested in changing and and in doing whatever we're doing better. So, I, you know, without further ado, thank you so much for, for bringing us home through this presentation and giving us an example of something that is meaningful and impactful that could be replicated or in inspire other work. So thank you, Gavin, so much for your wisdom. Well, uh, thank you, uh, and, uh, and really my hat's off to both you, Lucy, and Steve for, for, for running this. I think, it, I think it's great. It's part of that overall effort of looking outside and working with each other. And that's absolutely crucial for us. And I tell you what, there is... Um, when you do work with these children, when you do work with um, these groups, and you find that common ground, even though there are so many differences uh, between us, uh, 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 but you feel the pools of those different things like language, um, like uh, uh, approaches to what is really important in life, uh, don't see them as enemies, see them as things that we can, we can address together in some way. Uh, so we're going to wrap up now, everyone. I'm going to post the link to our closing session where we will debrief and give you the mic and have people share their experiences and that sort of thing uh, throughout the week. We always do this for about a half an hour after the conference uh, ends to kind of uh, uh, wean ourselves from, from the conference, I guess. Um, please give virtual applause to... Uh, Gavin, and you can do that by going under the participants window and you'll see uh, a little smiley face and you, there's a pull down menu and you can give him virtual applause. Uh, I think he would really appreciate that. Uh, Gavin, do you want to type your email or anything in the, if anybody wants to reach out to you in the chat, that would be great. Um, I shall just do that. Okay. 
And uh, if you have any questions, follow up with Gavin um, through email or Twitter. And I also highly recommend, Gavin, do you want to say a last minute plug about um, the Education World Forum? I mean, it's, it's a policy-oriented think tank kind of event. But I think it's really interesting, and and the public might be interested in what you do with that. So if you want to give us a quick plug for that, because that comes up in in January, right? It does. It, 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 what I have to say is it's it's it, it's an event for ministers of education primarily, and so in January this year we had 81 ministers of education, 97 countries, and 774, no, 744 participants altogether. Uh, and really, what we're talking about is the policy that uh, policies for the future. And of course, there's all kinds of things that are absolutely critical at the moment. For example, education in emergencies is one of those things. Those are the kinds of things we talk about. Uh, unfortunately, it's not an open conference. It's one which is by invitation only. But uh, it's one of, I suppose, many things that in which I'm involved, which is really trying to build community. Part of what I, I wanted was not that um, if for the Education World Forum, not somewhere where ministers would speak to the audience uh, as though it was, uh, you know, they were saying how wonderful our education system is, but a place where they could speak to each other and talk about the problems they faced and learn from each other about some of the solutions that were working. So, but I think we all need those sorts of spaces that we can have safely. Uh, and without actually being uh, pulled, uh, you know, where, where we can be honest, where we can uh, just not try and be saying how wonderful everything is, but where we're actually stating our problems and looking for us for help. So I think um, that we all need to have these sorts of events where that kind of thing is happening. And, this and one what's so wonderful is, is for that you can you can be the translator of, you know, people like us on the ground to those to those ministers of education. And I think, you know, you, you have this wonderful ability to be able to talk and inspire all different kinds of people in this space. So it's it's I think it's heartwarming that we know that somebody's advocating for the things that, that we kind of share in this community. You're you're working on the other end of it to to do the same. So um uh, take a look at the website, everyone. It's interesting, and I don't know if the videos are on that you did a couple years ago with some of those ministers. I loved those yeah. videos. Um, they're they, fun they to look certainly, at. Certainly are they. I, 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 what I should say is that uh, you can call it the other end of our work, of my work, but the, the, it's absolutely central. You'll also, Lucy, you will know and Steve knows uh, my uh, absolute belief in student voice and um, how absolutely critical that is, and valu valuing voice in learning. So it's, um, I, I hope I'm, I'm not over-focused on any part of this, but that it's, um, it's a balance of all these things, and actually seeing that people have the competence to use their own voice and to express their fears, uh, their hopes and fears, and uh, learn from each other without feeling threatened by anybody. Uh, whether you're a minister of education, whether you're a child in primary five, or, or whatever age you may, may be, that you can be in these safe spaces. Perfect way to end, safe spaces. Uh, thank you again, and we'll be in touch, Gavin. Uh, thanks, everybody, for coming, and you can join us in our closing session in about one minute. The link is in the chat, and uh, we'll see you next year, Gavin, hopefully. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you.